So I think we are going to start. Uh, we are going to start. So thank you very much, everyone, to, to, uh, to come to our uh, innovative discovery series uh, talks. We are delighted to have all of you here. So we are delighted and honored to have Dr. Simons here giving us a talk for the Health Literacy Month. Before I uh, uh, describe his, uh, all his, before his introduction, I have a few housekeeping uh, points to, to uh, talk about. So online participants, please keep the mics muted unless asking a question. Use the chat feature in BlueJeans if you have technical questions. Previous presentations are available on our website, the decpr.org. Please make sure you sign in. And next, we'll have on Monday, um, October 19th, field trials in developing countries, lessons from the prospective urban rural epidemiology study by Dr. Oman, Omar Rahman. Uh, then on Friday, on October 23rd, we'll have a quantitative model for GLACOG remodeling in atherosclerosis by Dr. Pak Wing Folk from the University of Delaware. And then uh, on October 30th, we have a collaboration in global health, the Global Network for Women and Children's Health Research by Dr. Shiva Gouda, Dr. Derman, who is here, and Dr. Omar so, and also for all the participants, uh, please RSVP so that you can better prepare for the next session. So, I'm, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Simons here. Dr. Simons is an associate professor, uh, MPH program director as, at Thomas Jefferson University. He obtained a doctorate in public health from UCLA in community health sciences. He had several faculty positions at Drexel, Delaware State, University of Delaware prior to uh, getting uh, to Thomas Jefferson, and I didn't know, but between 1996 and 2003, Dr. Simons worked at Christiana, first as a Chief of Health Education and Promotion, and then as a Manager of Government and Community Relations. Prior to working at Christiana, Dr. Simons worked as a Health Education Specialist in several agencies in California, and began his career in the Peace Corps as a health educator in Colombia and became also training director for the Peace Corps for the Latin American division. Since 2011, he has a, a very a prestigious Fulbright Fellowship in Public Health and Global Health to provide curriculum development, professional capacity building, teaching, and research in public health uh, at the University of Medellin in Colombia as well as the University of Girona in Spain. He has a long list of publications, very popular speaker on health education and health literacy, multiple grants from the P Pennsylvania Department of Health, uh, uh, HERSA, from the Association of, for Prevention, Teaching, and Research, from the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, and many others. He's also the associate editor of the Journal of Health Promotion Practice, the chair of the Academic Public Health Directors Committee in the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, and has multiple other affiliations, such as belongs to the Board of Directors for the Association, for the Association of Prevention, Teaching, and Research, and, and many others. So that's it. So we are really honored to have you here, and, and, and we look forward to your, uh, to your talk. Thank, thank, thank you, Claudine. Let me, uh, and I was hoping it would be just 30 seconds. I appreciate that because I know your time. So if first of all, it's Rob, and second of all, it's Simmons, but that's OK. That's OK. Um, do I need to be standing here by the mic for recording? Everyone recorded? online can't see you if you walk away. All right. And you have quite a few people online, I'm going to assume. That's right. OK. I, I will stay here. I usually don't like to stay in one spot. Uh, to be able to interact and stuff. So thank you very much. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, this is National uh, Health Literacy Month, and so uh, I had included some things we're doing at a particular event, a half-day symposium, as part of our coalition that I'll talk about, which now is not just in southeast Pennsylvania, but actually in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But when I saw your schedule and what you have here, I was just really impressed. So I hope many of you uh, will be able to get to one or more of the events that have already happened during the month and will be happening shortly. Uh, although I'm not going to touch on it, I do want to also mention that 
I am on a global task force on health literacy through the International Union for Health Education and Health Promotion that's affiliated with WHO. Um, and it's fascinating. And those of you who work in global, I'm looking at Dr. Richard and, and others, I'm sure. Um, their definition of uh, health literacy, just like their definition of health care and health promotion, is quite different, much more expanded and, and integrated into the society. We won't talk about that so much, but some of those concepts is, that I'll be talking about here in the U.S. Uh, about health literacy sort of resonates in the sense of what is happening globally as well. Um, have a ton of slides. Uh, we're not going to get through all of them in the short time. Very sensitive of your time and mine. Um, and uh, and I'm preparing because uh, going to a, uh, my my uh, I have three grown children and our first uh, child, uh, our daughter, middle daughter, is getting married tomorrow. But this is, and you can relate to this, I'll also be presenting, and it reminded me to say that uh, for those of you interested in global health, we have our Delaware Health Science Alliance Global Health Symposium, and that is at the Star Campus at the UD campus tomorrow, and I'll, I'm going to be presenting early and <laughs> heading out, so, but I want to mention that for, for those globally. So let me just, um, a couple of, uh, a couple of slides just to highlight, this is sort of the objectives, we're not going to, we're going to cover some aspects of these. Today, uh, we won't get to all of them, but I've included a lot of slides uh, that you can look at and a lot of references and resources, the last two slides, as well as embedded into some of them, have existing resources. So we're going to talk about very briefly, because you know this already, health and economic importance of health literacy. We'll talk about some specific strategies, and I would assume most of those, if not all of them, you're, you're somewhat familiar with already. And then we'll talk also from an organizational perspective and ask you to sort of assess your departments and Christiana Care and other organizations you're affiliated with uh, from an organizational perspective, how health literate they are. And that's a fairly new phenomenon here in the U.S. In the last five years, it's been uh, looked at globally for the last uh, 15 years, uh, using or, and not using sometimes health literate. So I have no financial uh, disclosures. And I want to uh, attribute a lot of the things I'm talking about to my colleagues in um, in the greater Philadelphia area, we have, as you'll see, a uh, we've been funded for over five years now from the Pennsylvania Department of Health through CDC and block grant funding, a priority of health literacy. We we started at um, starting at three years, went to five years, focusing on hospitals and communities uh, in southeast the five counties of southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, it's now been expanded to a statewide coalition which raises a question of um, certainly looking at the calendar here in Delaware for health literacy, whether is there is a Delaware-specific coalition in health literacy. That's a question. Maybe it's connected through the Academy of Medicine and the Delaware um, uh, Public Health Association. I'm not sure, but I want to throw that out because there are now over 30 states in the, in, the, in the U.S. that have statewide coalitions doing incredible work. Most of them are 501c3s and get a lot of funding for both public and private sources. So I thought I'd share that. Uh, and these are my colleagues that I've worked with. Uh, I call them the, we call them the Susans from the Healthcare Improvement Foundation. That was a spinoff from the Delaware Valley Hospital Association, which is part of the Hospital Association of of Pennsylvania HAP. Uh, my colleagues at, at both at the University and Hospital, Jim Plum, Ricky Brower, Marty Romney, you may, some of you may know some of those individuals, and then I mentioned the, the block grant uh, focus. So let me, before I get to this, I have, I've listed actually um, uh, five different very short videos, but the, you may have probably seen all of those. So let me ask you about um, first, your background. How many of you have had extensive experience, pretty much know health literacy, work with it in some capacity over the years? I'm just curious how many, you know, how much of this, oh, just, okay. So a few of you, um, I'm, I'm going to have to make a selection of which of those because I don't want to spend too much time on the videos. But uh, let me try the first one and see. And this is, this is, let me ask you this. This is a short video. They're all very short. Um, of New York asking people what is health literacy. Have you seen that? No. Okay. So that's we'll start with our patients, our clients, our community. So how do I go about Sarah and showing that? Oh, go click it, click it directly. Perfect. Okay. So take off from a popular show and uh, how do I go ahead and see if I can get to the open Hi, volume mixer? 
New York interviewing people about their health literacy. Can you describe to me what hypertension is? I'm guessing it's when you're really, really hypertense. I have no idea. Um, Can you hear this? No, but it sounds bad. I don't know that. Hypertension will be overactiveness uh, in the muscles. So is, it, is it when you stress a muscle or something like that? Okay. No, actually in the mind, maybe. Hypertension. <laughs> hypertension is a mental disorder. I don't have it, though. To be treated with the proper medicine. Hypertension would be overactive stressfulness. I don't know what medicine it is. Maybe alcohol, protein, something like that. Angina. I don't know, but it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> no, I don't know. I haven't done it a clue what angina is. What is it? No. Sounds like something familiar, but I don't know. Do you know uh, what a stethoscope does? Is it the same thing as a microscope or is it a totally different thing? Nope. No. First word that comes to mind when you think of your relationship with your doctor? I lie. Difficult. Three. Sometimes they don't listen to what you're saying, or that they go so quick that you don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> the doctors don't spend enough time with uh, the patients that come in. He never spends enough time listening to what I have to say. Doctors do not communicate with me enough because I ask him every time, "What's the matter with me?" He said, "Jason, you're crazy." I, I went to my doctor. Said, no one takes me serious. And he said, next. They listen to your input in the beginning to figure out what the problem is, but after that, I don't I don't think they care about what you think. I'd like to see it more honest, open communication. I don't think they always explain it to the patient in the same way that the patient would uh, understand. I'm pro-doctor, but everybody is not the same level, and sometimes I think they need to explain it a little simpler. With the college, they went to uh, so much school, and they do not communicate, obviously not. Okay, so obviously you know what the takeoff is from that one. Um, that's a way to get out. Recommend, sorry, sorry. I want to make sure I don't. Thanks. Just hit the uh, scale. Thank you. Um, yeah, this one's from the Library of Medicine. I think I'll move on because of that, but you have access to all of these. They're short videos, YouTube and others. Uh, we'll show another one that's within specific to healthcare. By the way, anybody surprised at that reaction? Maybe it was uh, not as harsh as what you expected. We're going to talk a little bit about what we do as healthcare, the healthcare providers do in the healthcare environment, and then what the perceptions are and what people say they heard from us, which surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, is different from, well, wait a minute, we did that education, and people are saying we never got any, any, any education on it, so why is that? But we'll get to that. So I'm going to move on. Um, so how would you define health literacy? Let me ask your thoughts. Anybody have want to take a stab at it? I have several definitions, because there's no one definition. What do you think? All right, during lunch, I'll, I'll give you a few then just to look at. So these are some examples. I don't, I'm sure it's not a surprise dealing with capacity of people. Um, not only obtain information, process, and understand, and the services, that's one of them, but this is important, read, understand, and act on. So it's one thing to read and understand something, it's another thing to take action on any of those, as we know. And then functional health literacy is the application of reading and numeracy skills, we'll highlight numeracy as well, which is really important, um, and, but to apply it to their daily lives, because all of us, use health literacy, not just in, the, in our healthcare environment, in our lifetime all the time. And uh, so that's why it's such an important issue. This is from the NIH, how they're defining it, or at least what it includes. Take a look at that. You can, I'm sure you would agree with that, and you may have some things you would add to the NIH definition of health literacy. Um, so what are patients, I mentioned this, what are patients here? And there's a huge discrepancy, and there's some references to pay, provider surveys of what they communicate, and now hopefully what they've included in the electronic health records. 
of the communication and education and what patients in those same patients report what they heard and what they understood and the discrepancies are ex 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 very large you know from what is necessarily said by and it's not saying that providers did not communicate and educate what they need to do but what's more important frankly as we know is what our patients are internalizing and say they received and understand and know what to do when they go home because it doesn't matter what we say that's not that's not the outcome the outcome is what are our patients and our community members who come into this hospital and others uh, what do they understand or what do they do about it or what do they think they understood so we need to try to uh, even that discrepancy and make sure that people are understanding and saying that and that just a very uh, you know typical example it's not typical at all it's make fun of it but you know that concept of one alcohol beverage a day is fine you know that, that's one alcohol. but we, but and that's just a joke but the concept is are we defining it as enough? And we'll have a few other examples of how what's on prescription labels and things and how it's perceived differently from what we would think. Well, everybody understands that, and we know that's not the case. So this is from, sorry for the quality of the slide, but this is from the National Assessment, just talking briefly about literacy uh, and the fact that we make a lot of assumptions of people's ability to understand and apply the information we provide to them. Um, this is, uh, and this is uh, a little bit old from Rima Rudd, who, Rudd, who's I'm sure very familiar, many of you may have read her work at Harvard, <laughs> certainly one of the U.S. leading experts in health literacy uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health. And, uh, but it does show that we're looking at, at, at least if you add up that 29 and 14 percent, you're looking at, uh, you know, 43 percent of people that are reading at basic, below basic or basic reading levels. So what does that mean as far as the, we don't we don't have good assessment? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about assessment of literacy, but um, really we're talking about think, people reading at the eighth grade level or below. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the reading level of the materials and the form of oral communication that we have at what level it is to reach those population? Because no surprise, those that are reading at those levels are people typically with low education, um, culturally diverse population and those are our most needy patients those are the ones we really want to focus on obviously to help them in make health decisions and uh, so that's that's an important area of focus and this one basically shows that blue population is five percent other but shows you some of the racial ethnic uh, breakdown uh, from the study on and back in 2003 uh, national assessment of health literacy the extent of the problem I think you you know this information, I want to highlight that first statement. It's a very strong predictor of health status, even more so than age, income, employment status, education level, or racial ethnic group. What? What? But the data is there um, from that, not just from the American Medical Association Foundation, but others in various manuals that show that health literacy is an incredible predictor, or lack of health literacy to health outcomes and health status. And it's important for that we take that for granted. Costs, just one slide on that, large estimates, um, but it's in the billions of dollars and the associations of health literacy and some est could be that the six to eight percent is actually underestimated as far as the cost to our systems, uh, number of visits, more medication, treatment errors, three times as many people with low literacy have three times as many prescriptions. Now, it's not just because of literacy. It's because of many things. Uh, but um, it's important to do so and the emphasis for that for our system. Just a, a framework, uh, no surprise on that. We have to look at culture and society, our entire system, um, our education system too. So a lot, one of the key players at, in the U.S. is the National uh, Library, uh, uh, you know, Medical Library of Librarians. And, and the librarians have played a major role in community levels as far as health literacy and their role. And there's a number of documents from that. We know how pro the process is very, uh, is from the AM AMA Foundation, the process of our systems itself, let alone the education. And there's certainly education as part of it. But it's more than education. It's our system. We need to take a look at that. So I'm sure you've seen this before. Some of the aspects that contribute to health literacy pretty standard things. It will certainly, I want to highlight aging and cross-cultural, multicultural groups, 
and how that information is, uh, you know, and this is just a, a cartoon to say, you know, watch out, we're doing it sort of after the fact. Can we do something ahead of time in order to uh, help people? Some of the red flags, take a look at those. You could probably come up with others. These are just pretty logical of what we call, what we would call red flags for low literacy. Uh, but these are some things that we should be aware of. I love that second to last one, ask fewer, asking fewer questions, people of low literacy. We know why, you know, and we will see some slides on that. But a lot of it is culture. You know, well, I, I wouldn't, oh, I, I wouldn't dare, you know, ask a question or I'm uncomfortable asking a question. I don't want to bother my doctor. Uh, it's a bother for me to ask a question. There's a lot of cultures like that. And a lot of people, certainly low literate people, that are not going to ask a question, which means, oh, well, in that case, we, you understand completely what, I've, what we've prescribed and what to do. And if, so the bottom line is if we don't get questions, we need to pursue that because it's an indication that probably there is not complete understanding and we need to move forward with that. This is just an example. Question, show me. Show me. This is a teach back example. How many pills you would take in one day? Well, for us, it's pretty easy, right? We think it's, well, it's four tablets a day. When you survey this example, a lot of people, well, I'm not really sure to what that exactly means. Huh? But that's true. So we need to, we need to educate on numeracy and certainly prescriptions. Uh, let me try to use one of these. Um, and I'll just try it with this one and do quickly and see if we may, we may not go through all of it. Struggling with modern health care. It's hard to be a patient these days. What's it like to be a patient? What challenges do they face? I want you to meet some people. They'll show us just how complex and overwhelming health care can be. Well, I'm a kidney transplant. I've had the transplant for about 15 and a half years, but I've been sick forever. Okay. Well, I take uh, baby aspirin. That's something new. Cyclosporin, prednisone. And when I make the doctor's appointments, I have to be sure that it doesn't interfere with his doctor's appointments, my doctor's appointments, or their doctor's appointments. So you don't like to go to the hospital where they give you a lot of papers to fill Paper, out? Papers, paperwork to fill out. Paperwork? Yes. Why is that? Because I can't read that good. Because you can't read that well. What does it feel like when somebody hands you a lot of paperwork and you can't read? It's feel like you're in another um, country. Vitamin D, Nexium, Norvasc, Cholestid, Estra test. When you enter a doctor's office, the first thing, and you, your first time patient there, they're going to give you a clipboard sometimes. That is very discouraging for a patient who cannot read. Lipitor, Paxil, Darvacet, Vitamin E. If I'm really embarrassed or confused or worried about things around me or worried about my child being all upset, I would not be able to read things I normally would read every day. You know, some of the words. Okay, so we're not going to show the whole thing, but uh, can I just hit escape then, Sarah, and I'd be able to get out of that? Okay. So there's examples of, okay, so I'm not hitting, I hit escape. Another, where, where, what else? Oh, just go back to the slides and leave that, leave that like that. Okay, so, and I'll now show you the other one. I think you get the gist of this, of, of our rec needing to be recognizing what our patients and our community members are, are feeling, are, are, but they may not communicate that to us because they're embarrassed. Understand, there's a lot of shame, there's issues. So we have to appropriately try to draw people out and get them engaged in something they're comfortable with and try to make sure, obviously, their questions before they leave a visit, their questions are answered. So this is rates of understanding of that statement to take two tablets by mouth twice daily. And you can see the differences. Maybe the differences I actually thought they'd be when I saw this initially uh, a while ago, I thought it would actually be a, high, a stronger uh, discrepancy or difference uh, between it. But um, clearly, clearly look at the difference on the far left. You know, double the un understanding and then being able to demonstrate it. And certainly low, low literacy people have less understanding of a simple thing like take two tablets twice a day. We think it's simple, not necessarily for everybody. So these are some of the risks as far as risk management. No surprise. Certainly safety and malpractice, something all healthcare systems are concerned about. And, um, and these are some of the other aspects that affect our systems with people of low health literacy, right? 
it's not just that, it's getting insurance. And this is a big issue with the marketplaces. And that's starting, as you know, the third year of our uh, health reform and entering, getting people into the marketplaces starts November 1st and goes uh, goes for three month period for 2016. Um, signs and direction, et cetera. Some therapeutic failures. I'm sure again, no surprise, not you know compliance uh, issues or adherence issues. Staff and just the time, that's part of the challenge. You're, everybody's so busy. I don't have time to spend all this time with each patient and making sure they fully understand what we have communicated as a team. And I emphasize, of course, the team because it doesn't have to be the physician. In fact, many times it's better not to be the phys physician can do a clear message quickly and then it could be some other member of the healthcare team to really educate and spend the time to make sure they leave that office, they leave the hospital and fully understand what the issue is and what they need to do about it. Some other failures, certainly a bottom line of organizations, it's good data associating low, liter low health literacy with all of this data. So it's obviously in the vested interest of systems to, to make a difference. There's some legal issues and uh, informed consent. And we were talking earlier about informed consent issues and we know the challenges. I co-chair the Patient and Family Education Committee with Deb Sabanka. If anybody has here been long enough and remembers Deb in nursing, a wonderful nursing and health educator. Um, and we chaired that for a couple of years. Um, challenge, the, probably the biggest challenge of our committee was dealing with informed consent language here at Christiana very honestly, and, and that's not different than other healthcare systems. And trying to get it to a reading level that people will understand for its education purposes, but we all know it's uh, informed consent has to do on the legal side with many other liability issues and, and uh, that affects us. It's tied to, we're not gonna cover that, you know the expanded uh, chronic care model, Wagner and others, but the point is there's opportunities of health literacy that fits into the model very well. And there's excellent studies that link uh, the health literacy and the benefits tied to the chronic care model. There is a care, care model, uh, just to highlight this, this is from Dr. Koh, who's now at Harvard, but he was the uh, Assistant Secretary for Health uh, for several years uh, before moving back to Boston. And uh, so I wanted to highlight this uh, from Health Affairs. Uh, healthcare quality, healthcare, you know, health qual high quality healthcare depends on successful patient engagement, we know that. Affordable Care Act seeks to expand that, so it's infused in the Affordable Care Act and a few other national things. And these models build on growing evidence that both patients and organizations benefit from supporting patients' act, patients active involvement in healthcare service. We know that. Now the question is how do we make it happen? How do we make progress over time? Some quick strategies. You probably know all of these. I'm just gonna highlight them. Uh, and there's def definitely references in all of it. Um, asking what questions do you have as compared to do you have any questions? Because if we ask do you have any questions, for many people, they're gonna shake their heads, just as I'm saying. So basically saying we've given you a lot of information and a lot of things for you to do at home. What questions do you have? You know, what, how can we clarify anything that we've given you and share that with, or in Teach Back, we'll talk, is to explain what they learned and then what they need to do. And that gets to the Teach Back issue. Explain, assess, assess their knowledge, clarify, and look at the goal of understanding. So it's a, it's a cycle. The problem is, what's the problem? We know we don't have time to do all this, right? We don't have time to do it when whatever minutes we have with patients, depending on the environment. But if we don't do it, we're not increasing the likelihood that they're gonna act on what we have provided for them. So we have a choice to make and it's a tough choice because we all know our system issues of doing so. But if we don't assess, and we'll get more into some of the details about that, we are doing our disorders to our patients and we're hurting their bottom line, which is patient outcomes. And certainly we don't have, you all know about readmission rates and the importance of readmission for certain things that we have done. So it's called plain language, one of the things, and there's, a, there's NIH uh, references, and I have that at the end as well, writing clearly and speaking clearly, okay? Um, key aspects of that, some of these are t typical, and there's many, many examples and references for that. K k breaking information down, short sentences, no more, we say sort of the magic three, no more than three actions, preferably one or two for most people because they're not gonna go remember all of that and they're not gonna do it. 
So what are, the, what are the essential things they need to know and one or two things that they really need to do? Simple language, using active voice, example of terms. These are common terms for us. Things like oral, testing oral. Well, we think, well, be by mouth. That does not necessarily understand. Many people don't understand, well, what do you mean by that, oral? You know? they, they understand dental work. They may not hurt, understand oral health, for example. The word diet. There's so many different def What do you mean by diet? You mean, uh, do I need to lose weight? What, what is meant by that? So we have to really be under careful of people understanding what we mean by things like hygiene and, and these types of things. Annually, we think we under everybody understands annually. Better check what that means when we talk about an annual visit and whether people understand what that means. It's like one time a year. Okay. So um, I'll try to do this. I want to we'll take it. We'll just give you 30 seconds. So this is at reading level. This is the simulation of what the lowest literacy people have. It's a, it's, and I want you to do it collectively. So you're going to have 30 seconds to read it. Hint. The words are written backwards with the first word being cleaning. Well, we'll do it. You're not going to have to read the whole thing. Collectively. Ready for this? Okay. So the first word is cleaning. This is in a simulation of what it's like for having very low literacy. Please, Re speak up louder. We need to hear you a little bit louder, please. <laughs> Just stay another 10 seconds. All right, 30 seconds is up. Now, first thing is challenging, right? I have a couple of discussion questions. This is about, this is what this is about. Cleaning what? What is this word? Anybody know? You probably much, pretty much have to be at least over 50 to know what that, heard this word. Yeah, what is it? A capstan. How many people know what a capstan is? Oh, believe it. It's got to be every... Come on, Richard, you've heard of a capstan. No? Go ahead, describe what it is. It, it, well, that, that could be used that, but what it's most typically used is cassettes and cassette recorders. Remember cassettes, those of you? And it's clean. You remember you had to clean those things that go, that go around for the cassette recorders? That's a capstan. So, okay, but here's the point. Most of us didn't know what, that, what the context, just cleaning, and look at the challenge. So, my questions, what was it like to read this? How did it make you feel? And how did it make you feel when someone near you at another table was reading it faster than you? It's just a simulation, but it's a little bit of a little game to, to get us thinking, what is it like to be a person with very low literacy that can't read or understand either the verbal terms or what, we, what has been written for us? Yes, Bill. Uh, my thing about this is that we were, we were having fun. We were, we were laughing. This is just this is the game. But one example of what you're talking about, you know, you're talking about the cleaning thing. Well, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and so everyone has, has this time with it. And this is, uh, you know, and it's about your, your health. And you're with people that you know. So it's quite hard. You're not quite comfortable with it. Just for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. So, um, and I will show this last one. It's only going to be the first one, but this is uh, from UK and um, it, uh, it's called This Is Bad Enough. Anybody see this before? We'll find out. If I can. Okay. This is bad enough. This is bad enough, so please don't give me gobbledygook. Don't give me pages and dense pages and this leaflet aims to explain. Don't give me really dodgy photocopying and do not remove for reference only. Don't give me drafted in collaboration with the Multidisciplinary Stakeholder Partnership Consultation Short Life Project Working Group. I mean, is this about you guys or me? This is hard enough, so please don't leave me oddly none the wiser or listening till my eyes are glazing over. Don't leave me wondering what on earth that was about, feeling like it's rude to ask or consenting to goodness knows what. 
Don't leave me lost in another language, adrift in bad translation. Don't leave me chucking it in the bin. Don't leave me leaving in the state I'm in. Don't leave me feeling even more clueless than, than I did before any of this happened. This is tough enough, so please make it relevant, understandable or reasonably readable at least. Why not put in pictures or sketches or something to guide me through? I mean, how hard can it be for the people who are steeped in this stuff to keep it up to date? Do you know what I'd appreciate? A little time to take it in. A little time to show them at home. A little time to ask, what's that? A little time to talk on the phone. So give us the clarity right from the start. The contacts there at the end. Give us the info you know we need to know. Show us the facts, some figures, and don't forget our feelings. Okay, so pretty impactful stuff in telling us about that, and that's the whole point, is is understanding where people would like to see, and I um, thought it was a pretty interesting video. Okay, so um, we're going to move on in the interest of time. Routine screening. So we get asked this a lot. Should we screen? And there are screening tools for health literacy, but can we do that with every patient? How would we know? Uh, it's controversial. Uh, there is a possibility that in some hospitals and healthcare systems, I don't know if Christiana does do any literacy screening of any of your patients and testing of their ability to understand or not. Um, but there is no national, at least I don't know globally, but at least nationally there is no proven benefit for screening individuals ahead of time about their literacy. There is potential for harm and which is why it is not, at least at the national level, not recommended for healthcare organizations to do that. But you can see some of that, um, and we'll get into universal precautions. So I just want to mention that. I don't know if anybody's, anybody know if they, in your department, your program, they actually screen for literacy? Okay. okay. But we get, I get asked this a lot, about that, and, and that's the answer to that. So uh, AHRQ, right, uh, did a wonderful toolkit. It's in the back as well, but that's the reference for universal precautions, certainly connecting with health literacy. And this is some of the aspects of, of that large toolkit, which is a great resource. Okay, numeracy, simple things like asking people, we think it's simple, to um, your insulin dose is increased to 54 units, to begin using a larger syringe that can hold 100 units, Please circle the line marking shows that you have drawn 54 units. Sounds simple, right? But not for everybody. Not for that. Because we know that a lot of people don't do that. So um, these are some of the things that are pretty standard things that I know you, you do. Um, and asking people to read, you know, um, those who look in a bottle and don't read the label may have certainly difficulty reading such as, and it's a very common statement, I take the little blue pill twice a day for my blood pressure. Now the good news, she, the individual knew what color pill it was. Hopefully she doesn't have several little blue pills and she knew what it was for. Uh, and she knew to take it twice a day. We hope morning and evening, but whatever. But that's very positive. So for a lot of people, that's what, means, that, that's what it means. And we know that seniors and others you know, it's the little blue pill, and I have other pills of other colors that are not so little, et cetera, and hopefully that individual knows what they're for, how, how often they're supposed to take it. Okay. But it assumes that. This is when people ask, we get asked, where does health literacy start? It typically started from this book that came out from Lippicott in 1996, Teaching Patients with Low Literary skill, Literacy Skills. It's now available. Lipicot, it costs you about $30. You can go on online and get it at Amazon for under, for under four. <laughs> so my reference is Amazon for it. It's still valid. And Cece and Len Doak uh, had a fortunately, while I was in Northern California, back in the 90s, I was able to go to a conference with them. They were absolutely spectacular. So there, if you have to ask, where did health literacy start in the US? It started before, but using the term specifically, it was the Dokes and Jane Root. Uh, I would say. So what about older adults? I want to highlight a couple of things in culture, recognizing the time, cognitive challenges. We know about that. This is stuff, the thing, information you know. Many of you are serving senior populations. Um, reminders, memory issues, certainly skill building. Uh, some other things, common things. We know about hearing loss. We have to adjust that. 
You know, we have to just how close we get, what they understand, uh, addressing back, trying to be in places where there's not a lot of background noise so they can fully understand that. Try, always try to talk face to face. We know how difficult it is over the phone. Vision progressively impaired. So uh, printed materials I have a couple of examples of print or uh, uh, certainly references of that. We try to get to 14 point. That's pretty large. So you'll see materials for seniors typically being larger print and more white space. And that should be for everybody, but particularly um, for senior populations. You have motor skills and dexterity issues, so a lot of healthcare providers certainly are aware of that challenge. Focus on need to know. Don't give them too much information, which we all do. Um, and uh, sixth grade reading level, preferably lower, is the goal. This, this latter point, anybody know materials, health education materials that you work with? Anybody know what reading level? Have you done testing on it? What? Well, yes? Roughly what reading level? Okay, so well over eighth grade. That doesn't mean, now recognize when we talk about reading level, we use education as a proxy often because we don't assess reading level for everybody, but that's not an accurate proxy. We know that. A person who has completed high school graduation, does it mean they're reading at the 12th grade level? Absolutely not. We know that. And so we have to really recognize that just collecting information, how many years of education you have had, it's proxy but it usually overestimates, we make assumptions about reading level based on that without doing the assessment, understandably. So sixth grade is ideal and even some populations under sixth grade. That is hard to do because we have so many technical terms. Uh, a general thing is focusing on three actions. When you do readability tests, and I have some references for you that, try to keep words maximum three syllables. Not also, not an easy thing to do given the technology that we have and the technical terms we use in health. Some other aspects about culture, so various culture groups, multiple languages, and of course here at Christiana, you see people with mul from multiple cultures and multiple languages. Ask patients what languages they prefer. Many, depending on their acculturation, how long they've been here, or what their native language is, will choose English, and that's great. Don't assume, well, oh, uh, Spanish surname, we're gonna give you it in Spanish. They may not even read, first of all, they may not be able to read, generally, no matter what language, but if they do, don't assume that Spanish is their preferred language. The ideal materials are, if you can afford it, usually bigger materials and more costly, English with different translations. But usually we can't afford that, so it's a Spanish language, or it's a, it's a um, you know, in Mandarin, which is only for Chinese, so you have a lot of other languages that people have, or Eastern European languages, et cetera, um, when those things are translated, some, the idea would be an English with uh, that particular language. Um, visuals, that's for everybody, for all of us, make it exciting and interesting. If it's just a bunch of print, uh, it's not gonna be any, doesn't matter what languages it is, it's, it's not gonna be attractive to anybody. Photo novels, or photo novelas in Spanish, stories are ideal, I have an example of that. Providing a cultural context, so what I mean by that is, and this is the health education, just having printed words are just printed words. How do you apply it? What's the cultural, what's the context of the utility of that? So if you can do photo novels and ways of providing that, that's gonna make such a difference. I have an example to show you. Translation, I don't know, did anybody do translation uh, here from other, you know, you need to do back translation back to English, from English to make sure it's right. And for all, and I bolded this one, all materials, should be, and it's part of health literate organizations, pilot tested with the population, intended audience for understanding. How many materials are actually have been given to five to 10 patients of different cultures in the targeted population and ask them and then do a focus group with them, formally or informally, ask them what they understood and what they plan to do? How many of them do that? Very few, right? Sometimes we use computer-based materials which are really problematic, certainly in translation. So that's something, and that is being a health literate organization. And this is an example, okay? Something that, that we do at Jefferson. Um, it's about breast exams. It's in English and, and, and uh, the specific language, and it has photos of them in a family environment about breast cancer, mom and daughter and grandmother, talking about the issue in a family context, how they can support each other. 
that's what I meant by context. A lot of times, sometimes you'll see that on the bottom of the page or, or the photo. Sometimes it'll be little bubbles, and you'll have them speaking through a, like bubbles like it's a cartoon. But it's in the family context. This is so much more meaningful to people than just the printed words about, in this case, breast cancer. If you can, it's more expensive. But it, the research shows it's clearly be, is understood and utilized and relevant to various cultural populations particularly. Specific strategies, pretty much you get a sense of this, accompanying materials. Ideally, multiple forms of communication. So that's verbal and written materials together. Um, and I mentioned about low literacy, asking for your questions. Bringing a family member. So that's another thing. How many of you in, in your education do you allow family members or friends, whoever they came with, to be part of that interaction and discussion? How many? A few do. <laughs> Why is this important? Because in many cultures, they come, if you've dealt with people from, I remember years ago from in Los Angeles, after the Shah, and a lot of Iranians coming, you'd have a visit with them, and I worked at, at uh, children's hospitals that bring children, and eight people would come in the room, or want to come in the room, because it's family. It's not an individual. Their concept of health is within the family. There is no individual health. Now, how do we deal with that culturally? And a lot of cultures are like that too. Latino cultures and, and certainly Asian cultures are like that. Do we allow that to happen? Because if not, they're not going to feel comfortable with that. You know? And the same issues, those of you from you know, Middle Eastern countries, particularly um, if it's a man and a husband-wife team, the, the woman is often not going to come in there unless the husband is with the two. And sometimes you're looking at the woman, but the communication is with the husband. And that's part of the culture. Difficult to do but we need to be sensitive to that. Navigation, signage. I think Christiana does a great job. Many hospitals have really moved forward with that. A lot of uh, different things, signage, directions, forms, telephone menus, example of universal uh, terms. But, uh, but you have to be cautious with that. Thanks, Richard. Um, just be seeing these and, these, and there's a whole lot more, doesn't necessarily mean that um, the people understand it. So do we have that here at, uh, you have this universal signs uh, in some cases where departments are and things like that? Right, Christiana? Some do, some don't. Okay. You want to be thinking of that. It really depends on understanding. So the movement, this is more of a global movement, but this is the latter, last part of my sort of main theme here, is called Health Literacy or Literate Organizations. And this is part of health and all policies and trying to get organizations literate. So there's 10 attributes. How many, are anybody familiar with this? The reference is there and also in the, at the end. Okay, take a look at this. I want to point number one. We were talking about this earlier. Number one of health literate organizations is leadership from the organization. It's got to be a priority, right? Integrating it into all aspects of it, preparing the workforce, continuing education, uh, various populations serve a range of literacy skills, Interpersonal communications, I underlined things that I thought to try to really get to it. Access to information services, um, both web website and others, uh, easily understood and act on, high risk situations with health literacy, and including then what the health plans cover. So this is big as far as the marketplace and people's insurance. So it's just a broader question. How, what's your clinic? What's your department? Is it inviting? Uh, most of our experience, you know, the, the real positive places within hospitals are uh, in the children's department, you know, pediatrics, because we see balloons and colors and it's a real positive thing, right? And of course, births are the real positive thing. You go to the hospital and that, that's a, a totally positive, not that surgery and positive results aren't. But um, so to think about how nice it is, and that's for employees too, that gets into health, health, uh, healthy employees. There is a national action plan. Just highlight a couple of things on that. And I'm going to move forward. Healthy people 20. How many people are familiar with healthy people? Okay. Oh, good. That's more than I expected. So this is this is always for public health, our public health students. This is like they work with healthy people on a very active basis. But there are healthy people 2020. There's 40. If just go on to, if you haven't been on it, healthypeople.gov. Okay? It's it's the fourth decade. So it's now 40 years of national plans. So we have objectives, 42 health topic areas, 
and 567 national objectives. So I guarantee you there's an area of interest in one of those topic areas to look at those objectives. And, um, and these examples came from that data source as far as now for this year, the first time in 2020, there are three objectives that are focused on health literacy. There's the action plan. They could take a look at that person-centered health information and skills. I'm going to move forward. There's seven goals to improve health literacy. A lot of planning and stuff in healthcare systems. And there's a reference there. Dissemination, research, partnerships, local efforts. Briefly, in the last couple of minutes, to talk about our initiative that we've done now. We're in our sixth year of uh, funding and support and giving a lot of that funding to hospitals to improve and also for community organizations. So we just got extended through the Healthcare Improvement Foundation. These are our partners. And originally, the objectives were focusing on cardiovascular disease and particularly with seniors um, 50 or above. And these are some of the things we focus a lot of training. These were the hospitals that we worked with in the greater Philadelphia area and various selected community groups. You may be familiar with many of these. Um, Temple, et cetera, Jefferson. This is the, the range of them in the various counties of southeastern Pennsylvania that we worked with over five years. Um, and then it, it was not just working with the healthcare system. So we do thorough assessments. Part of the grant, we gave each hospital $20,000 a year. And they could choose what they wanted to spend it on within the rapid limitations of health literacy. Some decided we're going to buy off part of a staff for our patient and family education committee. Uh, some did it, we're going to enhance our website. We're going to enhance, really look at our materials, all sorts of things. So our final five-year report was submitted to Pennsylvania Department of Health, got submitted up to CDC, and hence we've got a three-year grant to now expand to Pennsylvania. So we have really good data. And what's fascinating, of course, is each hospital chose different things that was relevant for them what they needed to do. So that funding was really helpful for them. On the side of what we call peer education is the community. That's the thing with health literacy. We've been talking a lot of healthcare because that's where this is. But so much of it is how do we engage the community so they can come to visits prepared with some questions and they can be better consumers, which is for all of us, right? to do that. So it's both sided. It's not just focused on healthcare. It's focused on the community, which is much more of a global thing. So you're probably familiar with Ask Me Three, National Patient Safety Foundation. Very simple questions. What's your main problem? What do you need? What do I need to do about it? And why is it important for me to do it? And this is our whole, so we've used this as a model and training activities of peer educators. We have scenarios and we put them in and do triads with, um, and one person playing a role of a provider, another person being the patient, and the other is observer, listening, viewing, and then feeding back what was that communication like. In those scenarios, we have one on diabetes, we have condition of heart failure, um, trying to think what the other one, cardi uh, try to think, uh, cancer. Uh, so we have different scenarios that we put them through, and they can practice, and that's how they learn. Uh, some of our partners will move on because of time. Uh, we do assessments and stuff, and uh, we're going to move forward because of time. So this is just some of the things that we've done. Really simple. This is how we've reached with the healthcare providers, those hospitals in greater Philadelphia area. So how many we reach, how many we've trained, employed. So we've done a lot of training. We've done it in three cycles, and now they're interested in combining it. And it's also available now. We're doing web-based training so because we know how difficult it is to reach people in their time environment uh, to do that. Some results as far as our training. Overall, the policies and impact on partner organizations. And this is our community peer education sessions. Some of the trainings that we've done in community, very multicultural groups, started with seniors, expanded it out, state and government officials and others to reach out to those organizations and train them. And then, and they get smaller grants. They don't get 20,000, some of the community agencies, but they do get things that have gotten like $5,000 grants to really help them. And they're the communicators because they speak the language, they know the culture, et cetera, uh, as a result. Some of the evaluations, as far as the overall increase, knowledge acquisition, certainly preparedness for training, self-confidence, self-efficacy. And the last two slides are just resources. So I won't go through these, but give you quite a few of those, looking at the time. Uh, some of these are great. Hablamos Juntos is wonderful. Most of these have incredible 
toolkits and resources for you to get more information. So thank you very much, and now we'll take some questions if we have time, and I understand so several people, of course, have to leave. Thanks again. So any questions about anything we talked about? I want to share your experience for those who can stay. Please. Uh, Rob, we've known each other, so I'm going to challenge you with a, uh, a little bit of a question of field. Okay. Is there a role for healthcare institutions and physicians and other providers in particular to uh, be more engaged in education and supporting education with the thought that, that you said, you know, somebody that we, we know that these very strong linkages between general literacy and health outcomes for populations. So what are your thoughts there? Well, it's a, it's a good question, obviously. Um, a lot of things, we all, you all know the answers to that and the challenges with that is, with, um, and we hope that patient-centered medical homes or, and, uh, or we call them, try to call them community-centered health homes at a community level with community health workers and others um, and, uh, and accountable care organizations with working with team-based care uh, from health, community health promoters up through physicians as, as team leaders, um, that there's more of an, hopefully more of an opportunity, but we all know the challenges of the economics um, you, we, you can bill for a health education visit, but the, you know you, we all know what the billing, rec the receipts of that billing are. They're pretty small and low on that, and so typically education has not gotten being able to be billed for. And given our system, that's where the rubber hits the road. No surprise, right? If you can't bill for it, do I take the time to do it? And I'm open to you know questions and thoughts on it on how you can incorporate education and make it worth the economic value that people are under with our current system. The system is changing, but it's frankly going to be a slow change. I don't know if that answers your question. You, you didn't, but I, and because we didn't understand each other, I meant schools. I, I meant oh. K-12. Okay. I, I uh, wasn't even referring. Then, then I do have an answer to that, and we can talk offline of that, because um, very familiar with school health education. And, so, and we all know, I mean, I go back growing up in L.A. when we had morning recess, afternoon recess, a gym class every day, and then often after school. We know what's happened with physical activity and health education. Now, saying that, the answer is, I don't think it'll happen, but it's great. We passed the Every Child Achieves Act in the Senate this past year. That codified in the educate the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the ESEA, which is the holy grail for the Department of Education and all school districts nationwide. Health education and physical education were not core subjects. Geom um, geology was, or is, art and music weren't either. The In the Senate, it's called Every Child Achieves Act. Please look it up. It was passed, uh, it was passed in July or June, excuse me, uh, but it's now in conference committee, and the House has a different bill that does not include health education or physical education. What that bill does, so please look it up, it's passed in the Senate, it's now hopefully be part of conference, is it will make health education and physical education a core subject K through 12. But what it means, there's not going to be extra money because we know there's not going to be more money into the, into the Federal Department of Education, uh, unlikely. Um, it allows individual school districts to use Title I and Title III monies that they have available to now for, and they make the choice, for health education and physical education. So there's an example of that. Is the health literacy include? Well, hopefully it will be included in that. And there are some examples more, more outside the U.S. than inside to deal with young people and health education and particularly health literacy. We're piloting, by the way, a student survey uh, that I'm connected with that is international on health literacy, all of Jefferson. Um, that started in fall of last year. It ends the end of this year, December, uh, coordinated through the University of Auckland in New Zealand and Deakin University at, in Australia. 35 universities are participating, educating, trying to understand the health literacy experience from our students. For Jefferson, that's graduate health science students. So we're looking forward to seeing the results of that and how that may help over time 
add to health literacy education at the college and university level. It doesn't get to K through 12. So I hope that's helpful. We can talk more about it. Question. Well, not not necessarily not necessarily health literacy screening, literacy screening, okay. just general literacy screenings, uh, where you assess people's being able to understand uh, both oral and particularly written words. Is just the harm stigma? it's stigma is one of those harms. The bottom line also is just time. Who has the time? We have a hard enough time to do health education, and now we're going to screen everybody for a take a, and there's several examples, and the references refer to those. You know, you can do things in five minutes, but who's going to take the time to do it and then getting the score? And then when you get that score and you find somebody that has a low literate level, do you, what do you, what do, you do with it? You know, do you tailor some things with your materials and your oral communication to address that? So that's why it, it's just, uh, it's a great idea conceptually, but in most cases it's not been utilized. But it's focused on literacy, not health literacy. There's a tons of things, as we talked about, that healthcare organizations can do in the area of health literacy, of course. So I hope that addresses your question. Yes, ma'am. Right. Wow, that's great data. You want to public, try to publish that data. That's, that's important. It's similar to what we've tried to do with our peer leaders, where we train community organizations, multicultural groups, et cetera, senior centers. So the training we did initially was with P P Philadelphia has 29 senior centers. So it's huge, and eight of them, by the way, English is not the first language you will hear, so we get our students to try to engage in that. So, absolutely. The, the, they, need, they need both. They need the, the information, and they respect the information from physicians and healthcare professionals, but they also need to talk to a community health worker or a resource person, somebody that can then translate that and help them, and to spend the time with them. And, the, and you know, that's, that's what we're talking about. Please. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's an important thing. And often the sodium isn't there. We uh, in, in the city of Philadelphia, and this is a public health issue. Uh, we actually got a waiver from uh, the FDA. Uh, our menu labeling law or ordinance in Philadelphia was done in 2009 before the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. By the way, I'll always refer to Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act because there's 38 titles in that law of over 2,000 pages that are public health and prevention and they are patient protection. We don't ever hear about that because all we, all we hear about from the media and everything is affordable care and that's important. But there's 38 titles, but that's a whole nother talk about <laughs> the application of that. So it's it's a really um, it's a really great point, and, uh, and and to engage community members in that process, it really is a requirement. Not just it's not just the healthcare system's responsibility, but it's it's also the consumers. And we try to have to, if we can do it together, um, it's just we're going to have find better outcomes. Great examples. Other questions, please. Um, it's it's an assessment process, um, and uh, gerontology departments and gerontologists would have a good sense of that. We all know about issues of dementia, and now what is called pre-dementia, so we're getting there. It's slow, but we are making progress in those assessment process and try to slow the aging process down in cognitives, etc. There are wonderful resources. I remember working with Chris Oakes, a senior health educator. I don't know if Chris is still here with the Division of uh, uh, of Aging uh, within the 
Department of Health and Social Services here in Delaware, and they did some wonderful work with seniors. So uh, there's a lot of assessment process in that. Um, uh, I, I don't know when we say how to work with it, it's try to understand that and ask. Ask and, and be recognizing of, of both cognitive impairments, physical impairments, just be aware of that. Seniors, is it's interesting, seniors uh, from the uh, initial grant, the block grant that uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, uh, they said seniors were 50 and above. Now, in our lifestyle today, uh, we, I was like, huh? I mean, I mean I'm 68, so I, I don't see myself as, you know, how you define yourself is your ability of what you're doing, how active you are, what are cognitive impairments, and there's wonderful examples, national levels. The National Agency on Aging, uh, and they've changed the term now, so it's active living and stuff for seniors, really, um, uh, really have done some great work. So we're making great progress on that. So connect with those agencies if you don't have it directly and connect with your gerontologists. Yes? Well, and I, I think a tricky part about that, and I think one of the insidious forms of this where it's a problem, is when a person is a great verbal compensator and then you sit them down and do the cognitive testing and you realize that that's a And that's, that's the part that I think is hard because it, it does take cognitive testing to prove to a team this person's not willfully non-compliant. Mm -hmm. They can't execute the thing you, right. they're, they're saying they get. You know, it, from the education system, of course, is that gets into IEPs and special education. They try to do that. It's not perfect at all. But it really, uh, that part of assessment and understanding uh, of that is a r absolutely essential part and it is it is challenging to do uh, but once you've done you can hopefully then tailor the education and the services you provide to particular needs and we haven't talked about disabled populations but conceptually it's the same idea so you're right anything else well thank you oh please right right uh, just uh, just uh, the question was how different is at an international. And this is just from my experience. Um, you know, I um, I mostly work in Latin America, speaking Spanish throughout. But but I've also had chance to go to Southeast Asia, and I was at a wonderful conference in Thailand a couple of years ago uh, on health promotion. And it's amazing how they defined health promotion, uh, especially. Uh, I mean, it's so broad. It's infused. It, you know, it's infused into their community. Um, and I'll just leave this with you. How many of you are familiar with Bhutan's, B-H-U-T-A-N, next to, next to um, um, I'm sorry, I, I lost a train of my thought exactly where it is. It's next to Nepal. Thank you. Um, their happiness index and their 43 indicators. Everybody heard of that? Take a look at that. They define health. And we do it very much physically. And that's a whole other issue of how the brain is sort of separated is not part of health. And that's because we have a totally separate system for our mental health, behavioral health. We have a separate system, frankly, in healthcare for oral health as compared to physical other aspects, as we know. Um, they define health using the term happiness. But there's indicators how you measure it. What does that say? It's a, I was just amazed. I, I had not been familiar with it until I went to that. Of... Uh, Health is not just the physical side. It's not your kidneys. It's not your lungs. It's not, it's not your knees. It's all a part of that very holistically. And that's the difference. So health promotion is broadened out in the community. And health literacy that is done in other countries, uh, in my experience, is, is, is not just in the health system. It's in the education system, it's in the transportation system, it's in the commerce and labor systems, uh, all of these, it's in the housing system, it's all of these things, it's called the term is health and all policies. It's part of our national prevention plan. So the U.S. has started to do the, to engage that, but it's a different concept as part of infusing health within one's daily life. So that's a broad answer to that. But their health, health literacy initiatives are not necessarily in the health sector. Let's leave it at that. So they see health and infuse into average regular daily living. So we have, a, we have some work to do. It's very different in the perspective because we're so focused, specialized in the health system. Thank you very much.